Okay, so I would like to first thank the organizers for the invitation to speak here and for putting together this very nice conference. Um, so in this talk, I will report on some attempts in finding simple decitter vacuia in the sense that I will define shortly. So much of what I'm going to say is going to be based on uh, uh, these three papers. Uh, first with uh, Shaji Hack and Brad Underwood, former students at Wisconsin, and Thomas Van Riet, who is now here in Uppsala. Then as the project evolved, uh, we then joined forces with Ulf Danielson and also Paul Kerber and uh, Tim Rice. Um, I will also mention some ongoing work, uh, though in a much more preliminary stage, with uh, Yoshiki Sumitomo. Now, what motivated our work is, to a large extent, the observational evidence for an accelerating universe. In addition to inflation, which has gained increasing experimental support, uh, results from observational cosmology uh, including uh, the supernova and the CMB, strongly suggest that our current universe is also accelerating. Now, it's fair to say that um, this observation has triggered more than a decade of studies of the zeta vacuum in string theory, and for good or bad, led to the picture of a string theory landscape. Now, indeed, many proposals for constructing the Zeta vacuum have been proposed, have been suggested. Um, the most popular one is perhaps the uh, KKLT scenario. As Mariana also briefly reviewed, this scenario is usually um, uh, presented in steps. First, uh, background fluxes generate the potential for the dilaton and the complex structure moduli, um, stabilizing them uh, while leaving the, the Kähler moduli unfixed. Then non-perturbative effects from uh, gauge dynamics or Euclidean D instantons are then used to stabilize the remaining moduli. However, one oftentimes end up in an ADS vacuum, so anti-brains are added to uplift the vacuum energy. Now, besides being a popular uh, framework for building uh, the Zeta vacuum, this is also a starting point, point for many uh, string inflationary models as we will be reviewed tomorrow. However, in fine print, it is actually not so uh, easy to construct an explicit Zeta vacuum within this framework. Um, first of all, the non-perturbative effects which were used to stabilize the Kähler moduli are difficult to compute in full details. So most work on the subject uh, demonstrate only the existence of these uh, non-perturbative effects instead of computing the actual contributions. And oftentimes, the full moduli dependence of this instanton effects is suppressed. Um, one can assume that some of the moduli are much heavier than the other. Um, however, if there's no big hierarchy in the masses between these moduli, the precise functional, the precise functional form is important um, for determining the actual vacuum. Now, moreover, the KKLT scenario is oftentimes presented in the language of four-dimensional field theories, using four-dimensional concepts such as uh, instanton-generated superpotential. One can um, demonstrate self-consistently that a stabilized vacuum exists, but without making this a priori assumptions, um, we ought to be able to show that a candidate vacuum actually solved the 10-dimensional equation of motions. Now, in order to do that, not only do we need to geometrize these instantons effects into a 10D language, um, we also need to find the back reactions um, of the localized, localized sources, such as an anti-brains, um, into the full 10D geometry. And as the previous speakers uh, explained, this proves to be a very challenging problem, and so far only uh, linear perturbations to the solutions have been barely, known, have been barely obtained, and uh, analytic solutions were only known in some asymptotic regions. So it would be certainly desirable to find a simpler and more explicit construction of the Zeta vacuum um, in string theory. Now, simplicity is a good thing, not only in physics or philosophy, as we learned from the talk this morning, but also in the arts. Um, 
you can appreciate a similar movement towards simplicity by looking at the work at that time. It took many grandmasters many decades to start from something like this and strip down to the most basic. And as you can see in their earlier work, they were still struggling with minimizing the amount of details. <laughs> so our goal is to find what we call the minimal decider solutions. By that, we mean um, decider solutions that do not invoke any non perturbative effects or explicit supersymmetry breaking sources, as the effects are difficult to compute in detail. Now, the minimal decider solutions that we are looking for are therefore genuinely solutions to the 10 dimensional equation of motions. They can be analyzed within the framework of classical supergravity. Um, as a proof of concept, we will be content with finding explicit decider solutions without demanding a realistic cosmological constant or a phenomenologically interesting supersymmetry breaking scale, especially that there, there will be many additional contributions from the standard model sector. Now, these explicit solutions, though not fully realistic, may nonetheless be useful uh, for addressing some conceptual questions about the sitter space in string theory, for instance, a microscopic understanding of its entropy or holography, etc. So, in these minimal scenarios, the kind of ingredients at our disposals are only the fluxes, um, brains, which includes deep brains and oriental full planes, and curvature. Okay. Now, these ingredients give competing contributions to the vacuum energy and competing forces on the moduli. Okay. So the fluxes, for instance, contribute positively to the four-dimensional energy and tend to make the internal space expand. Um, deep brains, on the other hand, um, also contribute positively to the 4D energy, but they tend to string the um, submanifolds on which it wraps. Now, the curvature of the internal space um, and the contributions to the 4D energies are oppositely correlated, as is familiar in, as is familiar in ADS5 plus S5. So finding the minimal decision solutions that we are looking for amounts to finding a balance between these competing ingredients. Now, the precise set of moduli that we need to stabilize in a model um, highly depends on which compactification you study. But there are at least two moduli that appear in any compactification. Um, they include the dilaton and the briefing mode, which controls the overall size of the internal space. Now, there are many ways to define your dilaton, but I would define the dilaton in this particular way, such that um, the kinetic term for this universal moduli in the 4D Einstein's frame, frame do not mix. Now, you can convince yourself that all these different ingredients that I have uh, introduced scale with this universal moduli in some specific way. And it's uh, very easy to figure that out. And so um, from the structure of this potential, you could ask whether there may exist a minimum, hopefully at large volume and weak coupling, so you can trust the calculation that, uh, trust the approximations that you have made. So to see what we can say from just looking at the scaling of the potential, um, let's be specific and look at a particular corner of string theory, type 2a string theory with intersecting brains in the Calabria oriented folds. Um, it turns out, um, simply from the scaling, we are led to a very useful no-go theorem on this iterative vacuum. Now, this, of course, does not mean that these intersecting brain models cannot be made compatible with an accelerating universe. It just means that the ingredients that you need to introduce would, be, uh, would not be minimal. Okay? Now, this class of intersecting brain models are also interesting in that um, they have been a very popular framework for building realistic particle physics from string theory. So the no-go theorem is very easy to understand. Um, in the Calabria space, the curvature contributions that uh, is one of the ingredients that we use vanishes. So the potential is really a competition between the various fluxes and the d-brains. So in our case, it's only d6 brains and o6 planes. Um, from the scaling of the potential, one can find a simple uh, but useful inequality, which uh, tells us something interesting about the class of the type of minimum that could uh, appear. At a critical point, 
uh, the derivative of the potential vanishes. And this inequality tells us that the potential at the critical point is necessarily smaller than or equal to zero. And this excludes um, a de Sitter vacuum. And it's also not very difficult to, con to convince yourself that because the gradient of the potentials are involved, this inequality also set for us a lower bound on the inflationary slow world parameter, epsilon. Typically, they would be of order one. Now, more generally, for other type two theories with various kind of uh, sources, deep brains and oriented full planes, we can prove similar logo theorem again by finding Again, by finding, can you hear me, Phil? Okay, can you hear me? Great. All right, so for other, more generally, for other type two theories with various kinds of uh, deep brains and oriented full planes, one can prove similar no-go theorems, again, by finding inequality, an inequality that involves the gradient of the potential and the potential itself. And in some simple cases, one can even find, uh, we can even find proof uh, further no-go theorems on the stability of this vacuum by analyzing this determinant of the mass matrix of the universal moduli. So, of course, no-go theorems always come with assumptions, and there are ways to evade them. And um, in addition to fluxes and oriental full planes, which are oftentimes introduced in any case, we find that in various type two settings, one oftentimes also requires the internal space to be negatively curved. And it's intuitively easy to understand why. A negative curvature acts as an uplifting term, raising the ADS minimum to a de Sitter one. And we already know from um, previous works that many ADS, supersymmetric ADS vacuum can be obtained in to a supergravity using the classical ingredients that we have uh, uh, introduced. So in order to, but in order to construct the simple de Sitter solutions that we are looking for, um, we find that these are the minimum extensions that, uh, that are needed. So interestingly, um, such extensions were previously considered in the context of generalized um, complex geometry. And among this non calabria compactification, many of them, them are negatively curved, at least in some regions of the moduli space. So, not surprisingly, um, many attempts to construct explicit de Sitter models were soon made after um, various no-go theorems were fine. And in this talk, I would report on the results of our systematic search within a broad class of such models. Okay. So, before we do that, um, let me um, uh, make an important distinction here. Now, since de Sitter's vacuum breaks supersymmetry, we can construct models where supersymmetry is broken by the compactification, regardless of the, moduli, regardless of the value of the moduli. Such models do not lead to um, an effective supergravity theory in the dimensional reduced theory. And in this talk, we will be interested in models where um, supersymmetry is broken um, supersymmetry is broken below the KK scale. So supersymmetry will be spontaneously broken by the VEF of the moduli at the critical point. And so this class of models could, um, which could lead to an effective supergravity theory in four dimensions have potentially a smaller supersymmetry breaking scale. Um, their effective field theory are potentially under better control and moreover, we can compare our results with uh, similar searches for the Sitter space within the context of supergravity. So another point to make here is the 10-dimensional versus four-dimensional picture. So I emphasized earlier the importance of solving 10-dimensional equations. So why do we talk about the four-dimensional potential at all? Well, it can be easily shown that the dilaton equation of motion and the trace of the internal Einstein equation is equivalent solving these two equations is equivalent to minimizing the potential with respect to the universal moduli. So 
The 4D analysis which led us to the no-go theorem is a useful first pass. Once we find a candidate solution that satisfies all the uh, four-dimensional requirements, we can go about and check whether the full 10-dimensional equations of motions are solved. And, um, and uh, in the presence of uh, localized sources, um, like the context which was explained in uh, Mariana's talk, the, the equation of motions would become a lot more complicated to solve. And likewise, the four-dimensional analysis would also be a lot more involved because of the presence of the warping. But we expect that um, solving, we, we expect that minimizing the potential with respect to the universal moduli should again solve these two uh, key equations of motion. So we are now ready to search for the minimal de Sitter solutions. And since the background fluxes back react, a natural framework to search for the minimal de Sitter solutions um, is generalized complex geometry. And as Dimitri also mentioned, um, many SUSI ADS vacuum are shown to arise from specific geometries in, in this context. So our strategy is to modify and improve the ansatz or the fluxes and search for the Sitter solutions. So if we find solutions um, uh, from our analysis, they should correspond to su spontaneous supersymmetry breaking state in a su four-dimensional supergravity, which we can analyze using powerful tools from supersymmetry. So now supersymmetry requires the existence of a nowhere vanishing internal six-dimensional spinner, um, and we are going to consider manifolds with SU3 structure. So supersymmetry implies the existence of a nowhere vanishing internal spinner, and from this spinner we can construct a real two-form and a complex three-form. And if we are looking at a Calabi L space, this would be our Kähler form and the uh, holomorphic three-form. Um, in the Calabi L space, the internal spinner is not only globally defined, but also covariantly constant. So J and omega, the two-form and the three-form, are both close. Um, but for manifolds with uh, SU3 structure, uh, which is a more general class of supersymmetric backgrounds, um, the uh, two-form and the three-form define only an SU3 structure and not an SU3 holonomy, so generically, J and omega are not necessarily close. So it turns out what would become handy later on is this object called the almost complex structure. So from the real part of the uh, complex three-form, we can build an almost complex structure which is a real matrix that's squared to minus the identity. So this uh, almost complex structure allows us to define local holomorphic and anti-holomorphic coordinates, um, which are eigenvalues of this uh, almost complex structure with eigenvalue plus or minus i. And with respect to this almost complex structure, j and omega um, are of a particular holomorphic and anti-holomorphic type. And what would be useful for us later on is that from the almost complex structure and the, and the uh, fundamental two-form, we can immediately write down the metric. Okay. Now, just a little bit more background, which uh, was already uh, discussed a bit in Dimitri's talk. The non closure of uh, J and omega is, um, can be characterized by uh, uh, several torsion classes. W1 up to W5. Um, so for manifolds with SU3 structure, one can, uh, there exists um, a metric compatible connection with this torsion such that the spinners are covariantly constant. And for reasons which will become clear later, we will be focusing on manifolds that are called half flat manifolds. And that means we will be looking for cases where the real part, where the um, the first two torsion classes, W1 and W2, are real, and W4 and W4 are switched off. Okay. So for half-flat manifold, the conditions on J and omega are a little bit more simplified, and the torsion classes are forms that transform under SU3 uh, that satisfy some primitivity condition. But what is really most important for us is that um, there exists explicit expression 
for the Ricci and scalar curvature of this SU3 structure manifolds in terms of a set of universal forms, um, the fundamental two form, the complex three form, and the torsion forms. And because of that, um, this enables us to solve the 10-dimensional equation of motion, even though we are not having supersymmetry. This allows us to solve the 10-dimensional Einstein equation um, very easily for a large class of models. OK, so now if the Ricci tensor can be expressed in terms of these universal forms that appears in all SU3 structure manifolds, um, so should be the, uh, so is the stress tensor because of the equation of motion. And so it's natural to consider the following ansatz for the fluxes. So the fluxes and the, um, and the source of the oriental full plane in terms of these universal forms, J, uh, omega, and all the torsion forms that, that uh, appear in our SU3 structure manifolds. Um, and this ansatz um, enable us to uh, scan a large number of SU3 structure manifolds without specifying the details. In general, the fluxes could, take, could depend on um, other forms that are not generic, but um, if the fluxes can be defined in terms of these universal forms, then we can uh, scan a large number of examples without uh, specifying really the details. And in any case, this is also the form of ansatz that gives the known supersymmetric ADS back here. Now, the oriental full planes, which are essential to evade the no-go, um, should wrap some calibrated cycle. And to simplify, simplify our search, we will consider first um, smear oriental full planes. Um, that is, we spread the charge and the tension over the internal space. Now, this is, of course, not the actual situation. Um, the more precise treatment is to not make this simplification and find the back reactive solutions of the um, oriental full plane to the 10-dimensional background. In fact, um, uh, from the equation of motion, we know that an internal manifold cannot be everywhere negatively curved um, if the only localized sources that we have with negative tension, namely the oriental planes, are localized. Now, if we make that simplification, um, very roughly speaking, we are trying to solve the equation of motion in an average sense. Uh, but then that makes the analysis a lot simpler because uh, instead of having to find the back reaction of the background, everything can be taken to be constant at least in some simple cases. Now, because of the simplicity of uh, our universal ansatz, the, all the equation of motions and the Bianchi identity can be expressed in terms of, um, it can be expressed as algebraic equations. Okay? So algebraic equations are, of course, a lot easier to solve. Now, we are looking for the Sitter solution. Uh, we already know that there are many supersymmetric ADS solutions uh, in this context. And in order to find solutions other than the SUSI ADS vacuum that we already know, we impose some constraints on these universal forms. So these constraints imply some relations between contributions to the 10-dimensional equation of motion. And so this allows us to find new solutions. Now, we, we find that while uh, ADS vacuum are abundant, um, the Sitter vacuum are a lot harder to come by. And uh, instead of going into uh, the glorious details, um, we can illustrate this with a uh, few simple plots. Okay? So um, the x-axis here is the ratio of some fluxes. Okay? So we already scale out the overall value of the cosmological constant. And so whether we are interested in whether we, are, we can find positive or negative value. Uh, solutions. And so the x-axis is the ratio of the fluxes. The physical solutions exist only for a range of parameters. And within that range, um, there's only a very tiny window um, where a de Sitter solution, with, uh, which are stable in the universal directions, are possible. Okay? So it's only a tiny window over here. Now, the bottom graph shows a different class of uh, half-flat manifolds. And again, the Zeta solutions, which are coded in green, um, are 
possible only within a tiny window of parameters. Now, this is, of, this is even before we impose the microscopic constraints, such as flux quantizations or um, finding the right, uh, finding the um, my, finding the geometry that actually realizes the conditions that we have uh, find. Okay. So just to recap, um, we have found a set of necessary conditions on the fluxes and on the torsion classes um, in order to construct this simple universal de Sitter solutions. This is a useful first step. Um, but there's no guarantee that there are actually explicit geometries realizing the, realizing the conditions that we have found. The next step is, of course, to find explicit models. Um, only with an explicit geometry can we um, fully address the issue of moduli stabilization, because there are a lot of non-universal moduli that we need to fix, and as well as flux quantization. Now, um, among these S3 free structure manifolds, um, groups or coset spaces uh, um, would be, a, would be a, seems like a promising first trial. Um, for group and coset spaces, they are homogeneous spaces. So we can explicitly, explicitly construct the s free structure and test whether we can find examples uh, satisfying the requirement that uh, uh, we find. Okay. So it turns out um, the bottom-up constraints that we find can indeed be realized in um, an explicit group manifold. In this, actually, it's an SU2 cross SU2 group manifold. Now, in an explicit model, there are a lot more few directions to fix um, other than the universal moduli. So, in this particular case, there are 14 left invariant modes. Unfortunately, within the window of fluxes that give you a positive vacuum energy solution, um, at least one of these scalars is tachyonic. Okay. So could this be a general story? Well, this motivated our search. Um, uh, um, uh, this motivated our systematic search for such solutions. And we will be focusing on homogeneous spaces. Again, because for such uh, simple uh, examples, we can explicitly construct the SU3 structure. Now, so far, only very limited examples have been explored. Uh, for example, new manifold, uh, soul manifold, or some coset spaces where the uh, group is semi-simple. Um, there are many other possibilities that have not been explored. So our search would cover uh, all group manifolds and we will do so by classifying the six-dimensional Lie groups. So on a group manifold, um, there exists a co-frame of left invariant forms uh, satisfying the moral katan relations. And using this one form, we can uh, explicitly construct the fundamental two form, the, um, uh, the complex three form, as well as the metric. Now, key to our classification is Levy's theorem, which states that any Lie group can be expressed as a semi-direct product of a semi-simple group with the largest possible ideal. And just to remind you, this is uh, the definition of an ideal. So in particular, you can define a upper-derived series by thinking commutator of the group. And this upper-derived series is an ideal. And if this upper derived series vanishes at some value of n, the algebra is solvable. Okay? So a classification of a group manifold that we are looking that we are trying to exhaustively search for the solutions boils down to a simple classification of semi-simple group, um, solvable group, as well as the semi-direct product. Now if the six dimensional group is semi-simple, this is the complete list that we find. And um, we will be restricting ourselves to uh, algebra that is unimoduli, unimodular, okay? uh, because this is a necessary condition for the group manifolds to emit a freely acting discrete subgroup. And with this um, discrete subgroup, we can identify the group manifolds to make the space compact. And that's actually the reason why uh, our classification is simple. 
Now, this condition is automatic for semi-simple group, but that's not the case for the softwareful part. So after some work, um, this is what we find. Um, uh, this is a complete list of, um, sem uh, of a semi-direct product of a semi-simple uh, algebra with uh, the largest uh, solvable ideal. Okay? Now, the six-dimensional algebra itself can itself be totally uh, be, be, a, be a solvable gr group itself, and uh, this is a list of solvable groups that we find before, um, which I totally expect you to be able to read from the back of the room. At least they are much simpler than the 17 pages of polylocks that Anastasia showed you in, his, in her talk. Okay. So what do we do with these group manifolds? Well, we are looking for the zeta critical points of an effective um, n equal to, su to one supergravities arising from uh, manifolds with SU3 structure. And the group manifolds um, compactification does not break uh, that much supersymmetry. Even after oriental folding, we are left with an n equals to one, n equals to four theories in four dimensions. So to obtain an n equals to one theory, we model the group manifold further by um, the discrete subgroup of SU3. So among the Albelian um, orbifolds uh, that preserve n equals to one supersymmetry, it turns out only two of them can evade the no-go theorem for the Zeta space. So we, therefore, we are applying this, we can apply this orbifolds. Um, in fact, uh, we also try several non-abelian orbifolds on the group manifolds that we have uh, classified. So, uh, for example, consider the simple case, um, a C2 cross C2 oriented foe. The C2 cross C2 symmetry acts on the left invariant forms as follows. And the, these two CO2 symmetries, together with the oriental field projection, define for us uh, a set of oriental field planes, in fact, four of them, uh, which can be expressed in terms of the left invariant forms. These are three forms, uh, E456, etc. et cetera. Okay. Now, we also know how various, um, uh, we also know the parity of various forms under oriental folding. Um, uh, the, Fundamental two form and the real part of the three form are odd under oriental folding, whereas the metric fluxes are even. And for such a simple uh, group manifold, we can express everything uh, very explicitly, including the metric. So the parity under oriental folding requires certain torsion classes to vanish. Um, and this implies that we have a half flat uh, manifold. And we can construct the remaining non-vanishing non torsion classes from um, uh, using these identities. And, and then we can search for the decider solutions that satisfied our bottom-up constraints that we find earlier. Now, um, there's a long laundry list of examples, and um, it's quite messy to work it out. But um, our systematic search um, gave several Decider solutions. But unfortunately, just like the previous example that I have shown you, uh, there are at least a tachyon um, in uh, any of these models. Could this be a generic story? And in fact, um, in the supergravity context, uh, similar observations have been made. Okay. Now, um, another issue that one can address with specific geometry, specific, specific example, is flux quantization. A priori, the fluxes that satisfy the equation of motion um, may, not be may not be properly quantized. And even if so, they may force you outside the supergravity regime, which is indeed the case for the example that we study. Now, finally, as mentioned earlier, uh, finding back reactor solutions in the presence of localized sources is a challenging problem. But interestingly, all these issues are in one way or the other related to the fact that string theory comes with extra dimensions of space, and perhaps the problem that we encounter is rather generic for other realizations of the Zeta vacuum in string theory. Now, although we should not overgeneralize from the limited example that we study, um, they may teach us some um, interesting lessons. As we have seen from our explicit attempts, um, while supersymmetric vacuum are very easy to find, these solutions are hard to come by. 
And even if such extrema are fine, they are plagued with tachyons. So perhaps the usual estimate on the number of vacua uh, based on the number of allowed fluxes could be an overestimate, as many of these vacua are actually not stable. So to summarize, um, I have presented to you some no-go theorems for the sitter space. Um, these no-go theorems also point us to a set of minimal ingredients for constructing uh, simple de Sitter solutions. And we have carried out a systematic search um, based on a universal ansatz that allow us to scan a large number of models. Um, but so far, the Sitter vacuum have been elusive. So perhaps the main message I'd like to convey is that um, the landscape as seen from an impressionistic point of view, may be very different from that through an explicit lens. And uh, regardless of how the landscape actually might look like, um, the cosmological constant clearly has put uh, string theory in a rather unique position to make contact with phenomenology. And speaking of which, string phenomenology will be held in Madison, Wisconsin in August this year. And we really hope to see you there. Thank you for your attention. Uh, no, um, actually, we don't claim... Uh, okay, so in our search for... Uh, in our exhaustive search of Oriental Fold, did we include the possibility of turning on some uh, B-view? Uh, we did not do that. Um, in fact, uh, we do not claim that we have the full list of Oriental Folds that preserve n equals to one supersymmetry. But there's a good sample space of examples. Um, and... Um, uh, it would certainly be interesting to, to try to be more exhaustive. Ah, okay. Okay, so, so uh, we already had two different C2 cross C2 oriented folds, and it acts on the left invariant forms in different ways. Um, but um, yeah, so, so there are um, examples that uh, we have tried, but not exhaustive enough. Uh, I have a question. Just did I understand you correctly that you studied type 2A uh, models? Yes. Because the KKLT was started with type 2B, and type 2A always had some problems. So maybe this is not surprising that you are having these problems too. Maybe. Um, so I would follow the Swedish diplomacy by not drawing any conclusion. <laughs> There are uh, further questions? Well, then uh, let's thank Gary again for his talk.